It's safe to say that amidst the sea of terrifying variations of the Xenomorph species, Goreburster categorically happens to be one of the most bizarre ones. So what we're looking at basically happens to be a variant of the Anathema Bodyburster Xenomorph, which was inadvertently developed by the wide-reaching socialist interstellar superpower the Union of Progressive Peoples, more commonly referred to as the UPP, and the highly powerful human federation, the United Americas. Mind you, this will be an interesting, in-depth analysis of the exceedingly hostile creature, and we'll also be exploring the comic book series in which the Goreburster has made an appearance. So are you ready? Well, without further ado, let's dive right into the video then. Before we get into our explanation, we do have one very small request. If you enjoy our content, then please support us by subscribing to our channel. This is a small click for you, but for us it means a lot. Thank you, now let's begin. Backstory of the Goreburster The forced annihilation of Rodina Station at Fort Nebraska led to the loss of all data on how Body Burster was created in the first place. Of course, that didn't stop Project Life Force and the covert bioweapon development program Darkstar from making efforts to obtain a specimen of their own, may we add, through genetic manipulation. However, doing that only led to the appalling abomination otherwise known as the Goreburster. Please note that even though the Ovalmorph and the facehugger stages of the Goreburster are pretty much the same when compared to the regular Xenomorphs, the impregnated host will go through acute levels of discomfort and also look like having put on water weight, or say, something similar to flu symptoms like nausea. Tired as well as bloating. The eventual gore burster is massive in size, especially compared to the regular chest burster. That's not all. It also has this dark polarized skin and will explode out of its host chest in the grisliest manner. Once a gore burster is free, it will simply go on a killing spree, leaving behind a highly toxic, slimy pink residue trail, which upon coming in contact with will violently change the victim's blood cells, causing them to bloat first and then explode. With that being said, the gore burster will not evolve into the chest burster stage. Age, credits to its reduced lifespan, and it's reported to even die on its own. Aliens Kidnapped Explained For a better understanding of the Goreburster, we'll be taking a look at Aliens Kidnapped, a three-issue limited comic book series written by Jim Woodring and Justin Green, and illustrated by Francisco Solano Lopez. Mind you, a lot is happening in the comic, so our primary focus will be on the Goreburster and the events surrounding it. Issue 1 – The Nightmare's Just Begun The first chapter begins with smugglers Andy, Jur, and Eric having infiltrated a crashed starship on a distant remote planet, and judging the starship by its crashed look, it certainly seemed like a xenomorph outbreak in all probability overran it. After the group encounters an alien queen inside, they're able to dispatch it, but not before the queen kills Eric. As Andy and Jur start assembling the queen xenomorph's eggs to load them up into their spaceship, they find a sickly pink-hued ovomorph amongst the rest, while Andy excitedly addresses the egg as an easter egg. Jur, upon examining it, says it does not look alright, further adding that it seems sick or something. With Andy insisting that the egg is fine and should be loaded up along with the other eggs, Jur picks it up and carries it back to their spaceship. We as readers soon learn about the duo's immediate agenda with the eggs. The smugglers have plans to sell the eggs to the Gaia Net Company. The deal goes well and the smugglers are paid quite handsomely. However, with Andy and Jur trying to sell the pink oval morph to the Gaia Net scientist, the latter simply refuses to buy the egg from them. In fact, the scientist goes to the whole extent of suggesting the smugglers to jettison the egg as fast as possible, telling them to make sure that the egg goes out of the solar system as well. Of course, this has the smugglers both irritated as well as puzzled. When Jur calls the scientist skittish and tells him that he's seen dozens of such eggs, the scientist stops him midway. He tells the duo that he's seen hundreds of such eggs, and he knows for a fact that that particular ovomorph is infected, adding that there is just no way it can be allowed loose at any cost. The scientist pays the smugglers a bit more, asking them to put the egg in their ship's hot tank and blow it up. No points for guessing, things definitely didn't go as per the Gaianet scientist. In fact, the smugglers are seen traveling to Earth instead, with the egg, and arriving at East Barabazon. Andy wishes to sell the egg to black marketeer and local barman Uncle Saul. But with the latter getting the first glimpse at the quiescently frozen egg, he initially declines to purchase it. However, with Saul pondering over it for a while and believing the egg might pique the curiosity of media personality Daryl Zither, he ultimately decides to buy the egg. Of course, this brings us to Zither, who happens to be the host of the morally ambiguous television show Goad, and in this case, the unfortunate host of the Goreburster. During one of the episodes of Goad, Zither brings Ivy Derringer, the billionaire CEO of the company Skank, as a guest star. And it ultimately leads to Derringer, who had come to promote her luxury resort on Zither's show, to inviting him as her personal guest to Planet Celeste. Anyway, as we move on on the storyline, we find Saul calling Zither to his bar, having cited to him earlier that he had an exciting gift for him. 
As Saul places the egg before him, he tells Zither that he only wants a daily mention of his bar on Zither's TV show in return for the gift. A mesmerized Zither is seen rather closely inspecting the egg and also going to the whole extent of licking the tip of the oval morph when a face hugger leaps right out of it and attaches itself to Zither's face thereby incapacitating him. This has Saul pointing his gun at two of Zither's associates and telling them to get Zither out of his bar immediately. Zither's associates bring Zither back to his apartment, dump him on the bed, and leave from there. A few hours later, Derringer turns up at Zither's apartment with her bodyguards and envoy Chiggerman, having arrived there to take Zither with her to Planet Celeste. By then, the facehugger isn't found to be attached to Zither's face anymore, and Derringer literally slaps Zither awake. Zither wakes up feeling rather sick and decides to take a quick shower to feel better. Sadly, the shower doesn't help Zither much, and he continues to feel lousy. Derringer tells Zither that he's simply having a hangover, but Zither assures her that it's something else. The first issue ends with Zither, Derringer, and Sugarman leaving the former's apartment, and we get a good look at the dead facehugger lying on the ground. Issue 2 – Terror Terror Everywhere The second chapter picks up right where the first issue's events ended. Zither is seen being escorted to Derringer's personal shuttle. On the way, Derringer tries to explain to an incredibly lethargic Zither the high points of Planet Celeste, how it is a place with no limits, rules, or taboos. Zither's lethargic condition takes a turn for the worse throughout the journey, and he eventually arrives and boards the shuttle. On board, Derringer informs her staff that she's taking Zither to her quarters and expects not to be disturbed at all. She also tells Chiggerman not to be concerned if he hears any noise coming from her personal suite, further emphasizing that she's going to give Zither a chance to live up to his reputation. As Derringer begins to seduce Zither, he starts feeling obnoxiously sick. He's seen sweating profusely, and judging by his present condition, it surely looks like he's going through severe levels of discomfort. While this usually irks Derringer greatly, a large chestburster rips its way out of Zither's chest, killing him instantly, with the goreburster attacking Derringer. To her utter shock, she's seen trying her best to fight off the horrid-looking creature. It's fitting to state that Derringer puts up quite the fight against the goreburster. She even gains momentary success when she smashes the goreburster on a glass table. However, with the violently vicious goreburster lunging at Derringer and tearing her throat, she dies screaming her guts out. Ironically, Derringer's blood-curdling screams do not affect her staff. They all think she's just having a great time with Zither. As Derringer's personal shuttle is seen landing on Celeste, Chiggerman urges the crew to get off the shuttle and personally informs the then-dead Derringer via intercom that they have arrived on Celeste. With Chiggerman not getting any response from Derringer, he decides to leave Derringer and Zither on the shuttle undisturbed, expecting Derringer to show up later after she's done with Zither. Several hours later, Chiggerman gets a call from Brewster, the captain of Derringer's personal shuttle, who informs him that the craft needs to get both fueled and lubed, and that it's high time Derringer is told to step out of her suite and in turn the shuttle. With Chiggerman granting Brewster permission, he goes back inside the shuttle only to be killed by the ravenous Goreburster, who is seen escaping the ship afterwards to begin its rampage all across the leisure paradise. The Goreburster is particularly seen leaving a slimy pink trail as it slithers away to wreak unthinkable havoc within the resort. As for Chiggerman, he's seen asking for an update from Brewster, with his questions unattended, and upon not getting any response from Brewster, Chiggerman makes his way back to the shuttle, where he's horrified to discover Brewster's mangled remains, followed by whatever is left of Derringer and Zither. The Goreburster on the other end is seen busy attacking and brutally killing several employees as well as patrons. We come back to Chiggerman, who not only manages to get his hands on a new pilot, but also has Commander Tennyson prepped up for an immediate departure for Earth, aiming to keep the whole massacre on board the craft under wraps. Meanwhile, Cyborg Director Drummond begins to investigate the slaughter carried out by the nasty-looking, unforgiving Goreburster. Hoping to ascertain if it was an isolated incident or a full-scale attack, he orders his subordinates to bring a platoon from Earth immediately. Absorbing the pink residue trail, he tells his men that the entire thing is more like a search-and-destroy mission, eventually putting the whole of Celeste under martial law. When Drummond gets a Code Red transmission from Earth, he's asked if there's any evidence of a pink substance found next to the victims. Drummond is told to await further orders when he informs them that he also noticed the pink residue. The second issue ends with us readers learning that the Goreburster carries a contagion and that it spreads through a pink fluid that the creature leaves behind, which turns into powder after drying up and becomes airborne in the process, with us further learning that even trace elements of the substance secreted by the Goreburster is absolutely lethal to man. We find a winding trail left behind the gory Goreburster, and the creature is seen ready to make a nasty meal out of its next victims. Issue 3 – How to Deal with an Alien Plague The third chapter begins with Chiggerman suffering a bout of madness, which leads to Derringer Subtle making a U-turn back to Celeste instead of its original plan, which was to make an emergency return to Earth. When Drummond is finally filled in about the extremely dangerous Goreburster that is at large on Celeste, 
he has his security forces go after the creature to capture it. After tirelessly following the pink residue trail of the Goreburster, Drummond's security team finally chances upon the Goreburster's corpse and informs Drummond, who tells them to take the alien specimen to the biohazard lab and have it spectralized. With Drummond informing the commander about it, the latter tells him that the Orbo Lab has already been monitoring the situation from low orbit and is currently making a complete spectral analysis. It's also around the same time that Derringer's shuttle is even crashing right in the middle of the polyzone of Celeste, as Drummond informs the commander that he's about to start the evacuation process. The commander tells him that he cannot allow him to do so, and that anyone who attempts to even disembark from Celeste without clearance will be fired upon. Of course, this has Drummond highly confused, and that's when the commander apologizes to him, telling him that he happens to be the bearer of bad tidings, and reports from Orbolab establish that the alien is infected with a class 10 virus. Drummond learns how Barabazon had to be nuked to prevent the epidemic from spreading further. Unfortunately, Celeste has also been marked for nuclear destruction, as there seems to be no other way. Realizing that he only has 10 minutes, Drummond tells his men to inform everyone to have the afternoon off. An exceedingly despondent Drummond goes outside, takes a last look at the burning Celeste, and sits by a bench. An infected visitor is made to sit next to him, and she's seen exploding into a messy pulp within a few seconds. The third issue ends with Drummond closing his eyes seconds before Celeste is subject to a total nuclear destruction, wiping out everyone in the area. How is the Goreburster different from typical Xenomorph chestbursters? First things first, the Goreburster happens to be the bloated, hideous variant of an otherwise traditional Xenomorph chestburster. The Goreburster visibly possesses way more hostile behavior. Instead of even trying to locate a place to hide and mature, it will begin to hunt its prey right after birth, and may we add, also attack its victims right on sight. With that being said, the Goreburster did not really have any evolutionary cycle as such. Its lifespan was extremely short, and it would end up dying within a day after its birth, seemingly incapable of developing into the fourth stage of its life cycle. Now, the most notable trait of the Goreburster happens to be its highly toxic, contagious, slimy pink residue that it usually left behind. Mind you, this residue would cause any victim that came in contact with it to suffer from spells of delirium, before swelling up to dreadful proportions and eventually exploding, thereby creating one hell of a mess in the process. The pink residue, once dry, would turn into powder and then evaporate into the air, making the whole environment highly contagious and leading to areas getting nuked to prevent the epidemic caused by the Goreburster. Marvelous verdict! Well, with this, we finally come to the end of today's video. So, what are your thoughts about the Goreburster? If you ask us, we're pretty much looking at a creature that's accountable for the nuking of two entire colonies. Of course, it cannot be taken lightly. Now, if you have something interesting to add, do hit us in the comments section, and if you enjoyed this video, you know what to do. Please leave a thumbs up and stay tuned with us, as we promise to come back with another favorite video soon. Until then, stay safe and stay marvelous! Also, thanks for watching. Have a nice one!